Anyway, <laughs> welcome to my talk. Um, uh, it's on Devon, uh, and uh, it's I've come in. I've stepped, let's step into the breach a little bit actually this evening because James couldn't do the talk tonight. So uh, Clayton, I said, would I like to do it? So I have things a little bit sketched out, but not probably quite to the detail I would have liked. However, uh, that doesn't matter because uh, I've managed to get something together in the evening times. So apologies if there's a little bit of brevity here. Uh, I don't mean it to be. Um, but I hope that you will take something away from it anyway. But before I do, I've got this uh, piece of um, potassium-40 radioactive isotope. Would anyone like to pass it around? I shall pass it around. <coughs> pass it around and have a look at it. It will become important later on. Uh, but we shall crack on with things anyway. So I hope you enjoy the talk tonight. And uh, if you've got any questions at the end, obviously, please ask. And if you can save them for the end, that would be better. So hang in there, and I hope it's good, I hope it's good fun for you. So, um, just to give you a bit of background, uh, I, I was actually born in Devon. Uh, actually, I was born in Lancashire, which is in the northwest. Um, uh, but I moved there um, some time ago, and I, I suppose I pretty much call it home, really, uh, for it is. And I've traveled all over the county, Cornwall, Dorset, the two counties joining it, Somerset as well. Uh, and it's, it, it really is quite beautiful. It's quite magical. I've always wanted to do a talk about it, but never really know how to start and where to start because it's actually quite a big subject. But, um, so a lot of it I've had to pray she down. For example, tonight you'll hear a little bit about him, but not too much, of I.K. Brunel. Well, he is one of the most famous engineers in the world. But we can start a little bit by cracking off and it's talking about his prehistory. So, Kent's Cavern um, is very, very helpful for us because it's one of the early English settlements by modern man, actually. In fact, about 2011, um, they radiocarbonated that bone and they found it could be between 41 and 44,000 years old. That's a very, very old time. Now, there is some contention, obviously, they found evidence around it. Perhaps it's not uh, as detailed as they think it could be, but it's a good place to start because the area in which Devon is, and it's beautiful geographically, is the fact that it covers, in some parts it has a microclimate, which I'll talk about later on, and in other parts, uh, there's just rolling beautiful coastline. You know, you wouldn't believe you were there. Geographically, it's made up of some very interesting structures. Some of it is uh, granite, some of it is red sandstone, and some of it's limestone. Two of those things are really important. You're going to have to, uh, uh, this will make a lot of sense but a little bit later on. We know, and Devon is made up of a huge area, most of it is, a lot of it is Dartmoor National Park actually, uh, which is beautiful. I mean, if you, if you want to go and get away from it all, and you want to see dark skies, if you're interested in stargazing, go to Dartmoor, because it is one of the places in, in the United Kingdom which can offer you total, almost total darkness from this completely dark. But it, there's been people there for a while, and this area here, that's a picture there of Grimsbound. Grimsbound is actually quite interesting because the name Grim, if you're aware of your Norse tales, it's actually a derivative of Odin. Um, how that has survived as long as it has, with the wall that goes all the way around it, to shrink, is quite remarkable. A lot of the talk will focus around Dark War because of its contribution, in actual fact, to the UK and the wider world is actually quite significant. But Certainly, if you were to go there, and I urge that you do, you will certainly won't be disappointed. So let's get into a little bit about what it is. So, what's in the name, right? So, here we are. This is the area of interest, and it's Dumnonii, which is, they were Celtic people, in actual fact. Should warn you at this time, I've missed out the Iron Age and Stone Age. That's probably a talk in itself, but I, could, I wanted to try and keep as much of it down to it as I could and it wouldn't be possible to cover everything, so I will miss out parts. I'm sorry if I have the Norman invasion, for example. It's really significant in our culture and history, but I've had to miss some of this out. 
However, it's Celtic Kingdom, and you'll notice it includes Cornwall as well. And I'm going to bust a few myths tonight, because I think it's really important that we do. Because some of you will be aware, there's a little bit of a rivalry between Devon and Cornwall, and it's right, there should be. Why not? But in actual fact, you'll find that we share probably more in common. I speak as a, as a, as a Devonian, a Janna, uh, than we think. And they share that Brythonic dialect, which is extremely old. But guess who comes next, of course, is the Romans. And this is the height of the Roman imperial power. We know that one of the, and his name is Schism, I should have mentioned it down, but I didn't. One of the Roman emperors actually does pay a visit here. And this section here, you'll see that it's just Dumnoni, or, New, or now Dumnonia. And they were effectively a client state of Rome. Why were they there? Well, the Romans were interested really in just one thing. They wanted tin, because tin was very highly prized and they shipped it out. If you've lived around where I've lived, you'll know that the last of the tin mines closed in 1989, 1990, uh, because they're simply not profitable anymore. But they have run since Roman times. That's a huge amount of time uh, for it to be done. The capital, Isca Dundonurum, I've got that out, just in my voice. Would anyone like to guess where that is? She not wants to stab a guess. It's modern day Exeter. Uh, Exeter was there when the Romans came. They immediately fortified and chose Exeter as the place they would stay. And uh, they were very happy, obviously, to be there. Moving on, we've got the Anglo-Saxon times. Purists amongst you will see there's probably a little bit of a discrepancy in the map. We're now moving on, whereas this now has been subsumed into Wessex, which was a very powerful kingdom in the Anglo Saxon economy. You can read about it. And there was an assimilation with uh, British and what they call vulgar Latin being replaced with Old English and a new kingdom emerging called Wessex. There's your Dane law there. But I want you to be very careful because. If you think that the Vikings, or those people, didn't make an attempt to get to this part of the world, they did. On the coast of North Devon is a little tiny island called Lundy, which some of you might have been to, some of you may not. And Lundy is interesting because its very name is a Norse name. It's very beautiful. There's only <laughs> Someone tried to take it over and have a kingdom of Lundy. That didn't work, and they tried to mint their own coins. Stamp collectors love it because you can collect puffin stamps and things like that. Not actual puffin stamps, but this. that's the flatterly of the place. So, here we come in with the Viking raids, I've just said. <clears throat> I've always been slightly uncomfortable with the fact that our good Edward there seems to be winking. Little does he know <laughs> what hell is about to befall him, but never mind. We're moving on. I, I don't know whether they're raising their hands up in horror going, don't do it. But uh, this is the Bayer Tapestry, as I'm sure many of you will know, which tells the story of uh, the Norman conquest of England. And indeed, the Danes did besiege Exeter. As I said, Lundy was a Norse name. And then somewhere around King Edward combined, com combined Devon and Cornwall together. That's, that's important because... Like, say, for example, and I just picked this out of the barrel, like Serbia and Croatia, or Serbians and Croatians, they share, share a similar language, it's, it's different. But they do have some commonalities to them. So I, I'm here to really try and persuade you of the fact that Devon and Cornwall are actually this, almost the same places in some ways. Now, I can hear people, <laughs> I can already hear the laughter already, of course, of my God, what is he, this is a sacrilege. But we share a common history. Want to see how beautiful it is? Well, that's it. That's Haytor. I think that's one I took from Haytor. That's the Milky Way. And I, something I do miss a lot is to be able to drive up to the middle of Dartmoor, one of the tours like Kiss Tour or Sheep's Tour or somewhere like that, and just go and look at the stars. And it's beautiful. And the wildlife's coming back to Devon as well. Years of cruel, cruel, very intensive agriculture has meant that some of the best wildlife has been lost. Cell buntings, for example, they're only found now 
uh, in parts of South Devon on the coastal strips around Maiden Coombe. But you should see them, they're beautiful birds. Certainly, as the Americans would say, not as popular as a cardinal, but one that you should uh, actually go and see and visit. So if you're ever of the mind to do so, you should do so. Forgive me, my friends. Devonshire is archaic, archaic name. It's not called Devonshire anymore, it's not Shire County, it's just Devon. Ceremonial County, and there's two military authorities in it, Plymouth and Torbay. Plymouth being one of our old naval towns, Henry VIII would have uh, likely to have created it. Um, Torbay uh, had, well, they had an election there to create something like a little, in, not, not, not a principality, that's too far of the word, but it's, they govern themselves. So for example, Exeter no more, uh, they, they take care of their own civic services, for example. Capital is Exeter, has been since Roman times and probably before then. There's a Lord Lieutenant of Devon and a High Sheriff of Devon. Now, the reason I put those in for those in is because the Queen still has a representative of her own militia that, that he can raise. Most people have forgotten this. But sure enough, uh, Queen Elizabeth II uh, does obviously govern through her first ministers and so on. Uh, but um, there's a ceremonial post that's elected, and then we have a High Sheriff of Devon, which also does the same thing. But I think it's worth actually just realising, because that's a history all in itself. And I think if I had the time to have done so, I would have gone into it a little bit more. But let's get into the best part, structures. I love structures and, uh, and buildings. And can anyone, has anyone actually, would anyone recognise where that is? Anyone, anyone have a start? What did you say? It is Torquay. Close. Uh, go a little bit. Bang! Well done, that lady. Yes. Well, ah, well done. Well done. Yes, it is. It, it's. Oh my goodness! Would you like to give the talk? Yeah. Um, so it's not faulty towers. It's not faulty towers. Well, we will, we will, we will, we, will, we, will, we can talk about faulty towers in a minute because actually, since since the chairman mentioned it, quick, 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 a quick segue on on the faulty towers. Uh, the whole reason, Faulty Towers, there was no such t uh, hotel in, in Torquay called Faulty Towers, that's not true. What happened was that the um, John Cleese et al. stayed at uh, one of the hotels, now since demolished, it only did one demolished it four, three or four years ago, and what happened was that you, you have to understand how hoteliers worked in the 70s and 80s, they were, they were a pretty terrifying bunch actually. And um, Donald Sinclair, that was his name, and he ran a hotel there. And the Faulty Towers team stayed, and it was just um, unbelievable. It wouldn't be like Italian hospitality. It was just, it was just a desperate state of affairs. It's to the point where, whether this is legend or not, I don't know. <laughs> I think it was Michael Palin had a, a wind-up clock in his suitcase. And um, he, uh, Donald Sinclair, this was at the start of the, the Troubles uh, from you know, the, uh, the IRA thinking that there was a tick, ticking bomb, took his suitcase and swung it straight out of the window <laughs> and smashed all over the front, of the front of the hotel. I think that's a true story. But anyway, Faulty Towers never existed in Torbay, which is on the south coast, uh, but they did base it on that hotel. So there you go. But very good. That is actually Greenway House. It now belongs to the English Heritage. It was Agatha Christie's summer home. She had another home. She was born in Torbay in South Devon. Uh, she lived there, and it was a terrible, terrible mess when, uh, when the, I think it's National Trust of English Heritage, I'm sure someone will correct me. English Heritage. English Heritage, thank you. Uh, I was very, very lucky enough actually to visit there some years ago. Um, if you like glass and collections and you're really interested in, um, we're, we're going to touch on Tariq because quite a lot actually tonight, but uh, she, um, she lived there with her husband and he was a, something of an Egyptologist. He liked to go and travel. so. But that's her house, and it's been thoroughly restored. There is a beautiful, beautiful Queen Anne uh, table and chair set in there, and the piano, and there's glass collections in there. It is, it is absolutely awesome. London Bridge, a famous statue. The one in Nevada, but the one built in, it was the original one built in 1851. British Museum. I got some puzzled faces. Nelson's Column, 
fuck would be happening here? Yeah. I don't know. Well, well, all of those buildings that I have shown you and the little thing that I have passed around you, what makes Devon famous is this little piece. I've just got it over there. Can I just have a little piece? Thank you very much. So, it would surprise you to learn that Devon is not only famous for agriculture, but it's actually famous for mining. Manganese, silver, tin, and granite. What built these buildings? Well, it was this. And it was, it's cheap, it's extremely hard wearing, and it's much better than its, its rival in South Devon and parts of, other parts of Devon, which is red sandstone. Terrible stuff, you can't build with it, can't do anything with it. But this was used and created to produce some of the most famous buildings that you'll see throughout the world. And I always look around and go, there's a piece of my home here, which I love. So when I look at the curbstones, whenever you're walking across the curbstones of, of, uh, around London, look down and you're probably walking across a piece of granite. So all of you that touched this piece of granite this evening actually touched a piece of history because this comes from Hator, which is here. That's... Hator now, gone, finished. Granite industry collapsed. Um, I suppose once you've paved a road, what more can you do? But that's it. And all of these wonderful things, and, and, and the London Bridge came from different pieces of, of, of Devon. Mary Vale was another quarry. And it was hard, hard work, of a work you can't believe. Now, to add to this, I usually go up to Dartmoor and it's a beautiful, well, when I, obviously I live in London now, but when I do go up to uh, up there, I go on a summer's day because the weather conditions up there are horrible. They can be. So one minute it's, it's sunshine and it's, it's absolutely pouring it down with rain. There's a reason why the army train at Oakhampton and the SAS send their people to go and <coughs> live in a cave somewhere in Dartmoor. It's brutal. It really is. It's very hard going, it's damp, it's cold, it's biting cold. There can be uh, frosts and uh, snows up there and down uh, around the coast, you go up to Barnes, to up to the north. Um, it, well, it's quite pleasant. <laughs> you think, well, how can this be? But that's it today, it's, it's now been flooded. But all of you touched it tonight, we're touching this lovely piece of history around Trafalgar Square as well. So I'm glad that you did that because sitting on my mantelpiece at home, there's a little piece of Dartmoor granite, just to remind me of what it is. It's slightly radioactive, for guys. Don't worry. About <laughs> That's looking at Haytor uh, across from, uh, I think, the southern part as well. I didn't have a chance to talk about it now, but I'll just briefly touch on it now. You're probably wondering why there's uh, why this country has so many hedges. Well. Hedges are an important part of our culture because in the 1750s, early 1750s, right up until the 1900s, it had, I think those the Enclosures Act, massive parts of our history, worth reading. E.P. Thompson will... Pardon? Jethro Tull. Jethro Tull Seedrill? Yes, mm -hmm. he was, yeah, yeah, not bad, folks. Uh, uh, the actual work. <laughs> 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 Mr. White, look at you. Uh, no, but no, uh, yeah, but, but whenever you go around here, you can see evidence of the enclosures, uh, and, and, and pieces of land being, being uh, um, I, I couldn't go into it tonight. I wanted to, but unfortunately I didn't have time. What's that there? Well, anyway, when, as you know, the original London Bridge, the Romans have built a bridge when they came here to cross the river. It's been several incarnations of the bridge, but the last big one was, I think, 1850. I can't remember the name, 1951. So they wanted to extend, extend the bridge, but they couldn't and in, in the end. They decided to uh, chip away and create some corbels. There's you know, corbels. So they started to uh, uh, blast more granite. But these corbels were never used in the, final, in, the, in the latest iteration of London Bridge. And there they lay at Maryvale for you to see. So when everyone always says, you know, that when London Bridge got taken over to Nevada, that's where it now is. It got, it got taken up and sold. Uh, the, the London Bridge you see today is not the original, it was built in the 60s. Mm. Can they, well, that one says 60s, yeah. 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 Um, 
But don't worry, because there's a little piece of London Bridge that never made it, and there it sits, and it got commissioned. Incidentally, uh, it was Charles Rennie, the guy that built some of the docks, commissioned that. So if you know your, if you know your history of, 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 of key sides and things like that, Charles Rennie, very, very, very important man. Cottages. Such cottages. So where I come from is quite important uh, for these things. And they're brilliant for the environment that they sit. It's made of wattle and daub on the outside, and you, wherever you go, less so in the town. So Plymouth, Torquay, uh, uh, Kingsbridge, places like that, you're not going to really see them. But if you go out into the countryside, you'll start to see lots of these. And this is what makes up the classic chocolate box look that Devon's so famous for. Whenever you see postcards, they're always building, uh, they always show you thatched cottages. Um, they're, they're, they're very beautiful to live in. They're perfect in summer. They do not suffer from condensation. I recently spoke to someone on, uh, on uh, Facebook and they're having dreadful problems with condensation in the West Country. And they were trying to use this paint to cover up this condensation. I said, forget it. You need to ventilate homes in Devon and Somerset and Cornwall. You don't paint antifungal paint. It will not make any difference. These are useful, so they, they are so cool in the summer, and they keep you obviously dry in the winter time. And thatching is an art, it's a skill, it's a very, one of our oldest actually. And when you see a thatched cottage, uh, you will see at the top the maker's mark. So it'd be like a peacock, mm. or an owl, or something beautiful. Except my sister used to have one but they were only, she had one where the cattle would come in, a bit like in Switzerland. You know, Switzerland used to have they used to put the cattle underneath the house mm -hmm. and then the heat from the cattle would rise and that's keeps you warm, right? Well, it's a similar kind of thing here, except that medieval people were four foot 11. I'm six foot two. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm forever having to do this all the time. <laughs> and talk and these. If you've ever been into any old pubs, yeah. and this is something else that I couldn't cover tonight and so desperately want to do, but I will pass some names off to you. I couldn't talk about pubs tonight and there are some beautiful pubs in Devon. But that's a very, very good one. They're very popular uh, on the Dartmoor National Park. And if you live on the National Park, you own one of them, you can't make very many changes to them without the permission of the National Park. And it gets to this extent because you can't, um, uh, when broadband is a nightmare up there, or can be, uh, and they wanted to put this little box on the side of the, on the side of the house. It needs planning permission for a box that's no bigger than like that. But if you put something incorrectly, they'll make you take it off. So they're very, very particular about how they, uh, about how they look after their property. Well, what's this? This is a Devon Longhouse. And these were, we share this in, there's a uniqueness between us, Wales, and Breton. It's really interesting you should remember this because our culture, we share with Breton, mm. actually. Yeah. It's very important, some of our language comes from Breton. We are not so far away. Uh, this is a longhouse here. Now, this one's made of stone, they can be made of thatch. Uh, and this is looking after your cattle indoors, <laughs> okay? Obviously being up there, there's a beautifully preserved one at Higher Uppercot. So if you're ever traveling around Devon, go to the one at Higher Uppercot. It's the best preserved medieval longhouse you will see. However, like a lot of places, time has not been cruel to uh, these places, uh, some of these buildings. And during the 1960s and 70s, they were converted. But they were a remarkable place to live because in them, you had all your, they had no real proper ventilation. It was a dirt floor, dirt floor, can you imagine? And you would take your cattle in, you'd light a fire at one end, you keep your cattle at one end, fire at the other, and you'd sit there and keep warm. It's just medieval England. In Dartmoor, how can you imagine what that would be like? But they survived and they continued. They were probably made out of the aforementioned product that I mentioned. And uh, they, they are fairly unique to west, the West Country. When I say the West Country, I mean Devon and Cornwall and Somerset and, and Dorset. Um, but they, they can be found elsewhere. So if you ever get a chance to stay in one, uh, new Sheridan Club 2023 summer house coming up, uh, I hear you say. Uh, Do we have to provide our own cattle? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Own incidentally, in, incidentally, <laughs> incidentally, <laughs> incidentally, <laughs> since, since Carhart mentions it, by the way, just a quick thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, by the way, the word common. When you see something called common, part of our enclosure systems, when people had no land, it was all given away and parceled up the common yeah. land where you could take your cattle and raise it. There you go, interesting fact for you. But, but they were, they're, very, they're very lovely to see out in the remoter part. Get a car or a motorbike or cycle, even, um, if you want to go and do that in Devon, um, because they're in remote, remote places. What's this? Well, every country since we can think of has, not, has needed to uh, create its own agricultural system. Well, you see them all over England, but there seems to be quite plentiful supply in, in and around Devon. And it's a lime kiln. Anyone want to stab at a guess at what a lime kiln might be used for? My dear, if you are, if you are, that's such a beautiful answer. But I have to say to you, if you're living in the long house, what plastering are you going to be doing? I have to say, water, dissolving bodies. <laughs> quick line does, quick line does, and quite, you're quite right, Scott Hart. I shall tell you. <laughs> we're, not, we're, not, we're not getting any strange ideas here, are we? Anyway. <laughs> no, actually, uh, but no, t t uh, tanning and tallowing of leather, go to Bermondsey, there's a history of things, but it's not that. It's not that. No, it's not that. It's Bermondsey. No, it's not. I shall tell you what it is. It is, uh, it's not a fertilizer, but lime is a soil improver. So, what happens is this. In one of the most dangerous, uh, I'm just going to whisper, in one of the most dangerous uh, activities, this is pre industrial revolution, don't forget, uh, a lot of things I say here. So, you're facing, effectively, what you're doing here is, as I said, limestone is a popular thing within Devon. We're now going to entertain the idea of cooking rocks. No, you, this is not that program you see on Netflix where they cook, it's not that. Right? Where you're actually cooking uh, rocks. So you take a piece of rock, you fill it with coal into a, into, into, this is one of the more contemporary ones, but you can dig a pit, fill it with coal, and then it's now going to start to cook rocks. So it breaks down, it gets the lime, in effect turns into a powder. The lime, this is before potash, guys, everyone just gets blood and bone and potash is mine now, but not then it wasn't. But they had to deal with the soil. And to deal with it, they used to cook lime boulders, put them in. Now a very good example of one is between Maidencombe and Tynmouth, that's on the south coast. What you would do is you would have uh, a person and they would stoke it and it would it'd take about three days for it, this process to do under intense heat, 24 hours a day. So you've got somebody cooking lime and producing carbon monoxide gas. And they would sit on the edges, A, to keep warm. Some of them were very badly paid. It wasn't quite vagabond's work, but it was not far off, I don't think. <laughs> uh, and they would sit there and stoke it. Some of them died doing this activity. But the idea was that you actually got hold of... Uh, 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 it was dreadfully paid, uh, but you, they extracted the lime and sprinkled it on the surface and it acts as a soil improver to help help mm -hmm. crops grow. It doesn't, it's not a fertilizer per se. Uh, a couple of scandals happened with these. Um, people have missed what they really are uh, and bricked them up, <laughs> not really realizing what they've, what they've been. You'll see evidence of this. There's a beautiful lime kiln on the road to Dartmouth. Uh, we'll get to Dartmouth in a minute, but um, it's a lovely one there uh, and it's just known. Everyone knows what it is. It's a beautiful thing to see. But that's one of the activities some of the rural poor would do. Um, talk about the Industrial Revolution affecting places like Manchester. You should see what the uh, agricultural revolutions did to parts of Devon. It decimated the working poor on a scale you cannot know, uh, especially with the introducing of threshing machines and so on. Uh, and, and absolutely terrible really it's this very sad story that the 16th 17th 18th century working poor in devon is a very very sad story to see anyone want to have a guess who lived here it's colleton fish acre oh that is very 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 good anyone want to advance on that but i like it it's built in the arts and crafts style by the way guys uh Anyone want to take another guess? It's the Doily Cart family. Yes, it is the Doily Cart family. 
You sir, I've got to, this table over here is just too good. <laughs> the table's pretty good. <laughs> You're just too good, sir. You're just too good. It is indeed. Stuff you come across, isn't it? You know what I mean. Uh, it's the Rupert Doily Cart of the Doily Cart Opera Family. Who produced? Ha 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 ha! Music, I think. But anyway, it's that Pirates of Penzance. Doily Cart Family were actually interesting because they bought uh, parts of the Strand. His father. Richard, hope we got that the right way, um, bought and developed the Savoy, but you know that. So you went to. I didn't do it. No, you didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's but they 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 um, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan did uh, operas, fun operas, uh, but they made their money and they settled in Colton Fishacre, which is a monstrously difficult place to get to actually, but it has. Um, it was built in 1926. I shall go back. The grounds and the house are divine. I can't, I can say this is what money does, and money does taste really well, and this is it. It is beautiful, it's peaceful, and it's set in, um, it's set in a microclimate, and it's set in something known as, and we're going to go back to a bit of our ancient history, a coom. So when I say what come dacum, uh, well, that's our Welsh, that's part of our Welsh, our ancient language, yeah? So whenever you see the word C O M B E, at the end of a town, you know it's very, very old, yeah? Obviously, Colton Fischer isn't, but it's in a little valley. And the gardens are in a valley and they produced a microclimate and they grew things, vegetables. Mm. I, I'm always massively impressed all the time by some of these families and, and they're going back to nature all the time. I really love that. Agatha Christie was another one. Her gardens are lovely. Go and see it at Greenway House. It's absolutely fantastic. You'll have a good time. Same here as well, but they built a microclimate and it's in a valley. And South Devon is very, very good for that because it produces these wonderful yeah. microclimates. Yes, indeed, with the doily cart. There he is. Uh, and he built it and lived there. Um, don't play around. Yeah. Inside here, inside the house, uh, I've visited it on a couple of occasions and that, I'm just going to try to not get too much of a shadow onto it, but you see that, that uh, what appears to be a clock is actually a weather vane and it's attached to something in the house so you can see which way, which way the wind is blowing. It's funny, it's lovely, isn't it? They've got lovely little touches like that inside the property. It's clean, it's really, it's what's of the art deco style on the inside, arts and crafts on the outside. Um, and the person, the person who, the architect who helped develop that, was the assistant to Edwin Lutyens. Does anyone know who Edwin Lutyens is? Yeah, okay. It was his assistant that built this. And you can see bits of Lutyens in here, I think. But beautiful. Very Pomeroy, yes. One of my favorites. It's, it's, a, it's a very old place. It's a Tudor building. And I'll tell you a little story. So what we used to do uh, when we were nippers from school is we would go up there with cider that we bought at, um, at Church Wards. Bless you, wherever you are, Church Wards today closed down now, sadly. Um, yeah, very sad. Our cider making industry mm -hmm. in the local farms, very sad state to, to see. Um, I'm sorry to, to inform you, apart from small little micro industries. Um, this was built, uh, what nestles now in the Gatkin Valley. And we used to go up there with bottles of cider and we'd all, we'd set one person up and this place is famous for ghosts. Of course it is. And that's Margaret's Tower there, just on the right hand side. And we used to, a friend of mine, one person would be nominated to drink, to drive, and the rest of us would scarper. <laughs> Sorry, not drink and drive, it's drink and drink and drive separately, let's get that clear. Um, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, well, wait till I tell you about the drain dropping later on, but we'll get to that in a minute. So we used to scarper and leave one person there in the middle of the night for an hour. Brutal, brutal ways of treating your friends. Uh, but, and it's, and, and believe you me, in the middle of the night, this is just uh, a little way out of Totnes. If anyone knows where Totnes is? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's not too, it's about three miles away from Totnes. It's pitch. There's forests around it. There's one track leading onto another road that lead, takes you, there's a, it's a good drive away from where you need to be. And that happened to me one time. They left me on my own. In there, I was absolutely almost in tears of fear. Uh, but they came and picked me up later. But we used to do these things. But it's very, very beautiful to go and see. 
the family, the, the, the Pomeroy family are actually, uh, they came with the Anglos, uh, sorry, with the Normans. Uh, uh, Berry Head uh, is named after, partly after them. Uh, it built in the 15th century. Uh, and uh, the Pomeroy family held it since the 11th century, but they got into a bit of financial bother. So they sold it. And they sold it to Edward Seymour, first Duke of Somerset. Anyone want to guess who he was? Come on, Brave yeah. Table, you can do it. <laughs> well, yes, he was Lord Protector of England. Fifteen forty nine. So there you go. So I've always, I always, I always like to think that we have a, something of a royal castle. It's, it's, it's not an aristocratic castle. It's something of a royal. I'd like to believe that. You know, whether it's actually true or not. Do go, but do go into the, the front part of the turrets there, because what they found in the 1970s was something really remarkable how it survived. I mean, we know that, it, which, which pope was it that authorised the quarrying of the Roman Forum? I can't remember which one it was, but they ran off with all the best stuff. Well, same thing really, I suspect, that happened here. Uh, but what did survive on the top is, uh, uh, a decoration of the Adoration of the Magi. And it survived, it's like 500 years old, and it's all, it's horrendous weather conditions have been subject to this, but somehow it survived it, and it's beautiful to see. So do go and take that and picnic like crazy. Inside there, they have, um, uh, does anyone go to reenactments, joy jousting and things like that? Is it, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, they have, they have things like that in here. It's, it's absolutely, it's absolutely lovely to go and see it. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so de definitely go and see it and take the walk. I mean, I, I, I cycle around here and it's, it's just beautiful to go and see it and go, go try and get to see it when, in the evening times when the crowds have gone. Uh, it's starting to get more popular, you know, visibly Google and so on and so forth. So, however, but does it always work out? Oh, yes, there you go, I forgot to see this picture here. There it is looking down. Here we have the bakery, food and drink in Tudor times. Let's not forget it, uh, food and drink in Tudor times. We had some of the best kitchens in Europe. Ask that, and we, were, we did. But there lies the bakery here. So then this section here, sorry, oh, I need the laser pen, no, sorry. Uh, this section here is known as the Gatkin Valley. This was clearly taken in the morning, but just look at the mist. And God, I miss that so much. I really do. You know, you come out for a, see your pals or something, and you know, you, you drive back, and uh, it was absolutely beautiful to go and, uh, to go and see. But worth a visit. And um, right in the background there, you can see the top end of uh, of, of uh, going to Stump, the Italian aid style. When uh, when this country got rich on the back of Industrial Revolution, they decided they felt, in some senses, that they were the inheritors of Rome. Uh, they really believed that um, it was their duty to understand this a bit more, and they did. So they went on the grand tour, which I won't go into today. So when they came back, the way the United Kingdom is. I'll just doodle this here, but you see it comes, if you look at the United Kingdom properly, it's not how maps put it, it comes down as a proper, the peninsula comes down the proper way, Scotland is facing out in the right way as it should. But they came back and they were so impressed by what they saw, they decided to copy the buildings. And they did, on something of what I would describe to be an industrial scale. So there's anybody here from Italy that wants to come and see how it's done, they borrowed lots of it. We had, and this is quite an incredible thing, this is something worth remarking actually, we had a window tax in this country. Yes, can you believe it? They taxed, they taxed the size of your windows. Uh, in uh, Regents, uh, George, Georgian times, uh, 1740. Was it Polish to 1850? Yes. We had a sealed window. Yes, oh yes, you, yes, uh, I, yes. Forgive me a bit late in that, but there was a window tax. It was about the size of the number of the windows. Number. 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 So had one dropped in. Yeah. So the, more num so the more windows you had, there was someone coming around and would tax you for it. But look at this. 
didn't care. They didn't care because they had money. Yeah. <laughs> now, what you would normally see, what what you would normally see, is sometimes on the end of these Italian eggs, and you see them as it's Kingsbridge, it's in Plymouth. Uh, there's some, not necessarily mid Devon, because it's hard to build in Dartmoor, too cold. But around, certainly around some of the southern parts, they would build on the sides of it. They loved growing things, so they try and grow things like. Has anyone ever been to the Sans Souci in Potsdam? There's an orangery there. Well, they tried to copy things like that, and they'd have pineapples growing in pot frames, and, and uh, they, they, were, they, were, they were very, very, very keen to do it. Look at the size of the, of the chimneys. I mean, that's some wealth to get that going. The coal alone is uh, incredible amounts of wealth. Here's another one. I, I won't tell you where they are because it's, I know where they are, but it's just for the purposes of that. But, um, but there's another one as well. And the grounds would be sweeping. So it's almost a bit like uh, uh, Capability Brown. Thank you, yeah. Capability Brown, he, he was, if memory said, he was the one that, that when you stood at the top of the, the whatever building you were behind, he would make it so it looked like you were looking on for, for, for forever. So, uh, and they tried to copy that with some success. Use it or lose it. If you think for a moment that people in the United Kingdom necessarily care about these buildings, you would be wrong. This is a very important building. It's Normount Villa. And it's probably, sorry, the, the picture doesn't do it any justice. And your reason why it's such an old picture is because you don't want to see what it became later on. Wait for it. This is, uh, again, it would have had a greenhouse on one side. Agatha Christie visited there. Uh, 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 Lady Price, the widow of Bert, uh, Burton's the Tailors. Her, the, she lived there. That was the fortune that bought that property. And they're beautiful. From about the 1950s, Devon, the decline in interest in, in holidaying in Devon, where the Romanovs had come to stay, I should add, uh, was in serious decline. People wanted to go to Spain. And a lot of these buildings are hard to upkeep. After all, you know, domestic service, well, that hadn't been heard of since the 30s and 40s. So no one wants to come look after these great big buildings, and they were A, being knocked down. <laughs> Can you believe it? Or B, turned into flats. Now, what some of the wise folk decided, well, we'll, we'll just see if we can turn it into something that looks like a hotel, which they did. You can't see it there, but in actual fact, you're looking at what was my old gym. <laughs> but it was sensitively done. But these buildings need a lot of TLC, because they don't last. They're solid structures, but you need to keep on with these places particularly since um, the plasterwork can move quite significantly. That's what happened to it. Well, I went there, I went there about seven or eight years ago, and I bumped over the wall with my phone. I wish I could have got the pictures out that I took. Unfortunately, I've got 7,000 plus pictures on my cloud at the moment. I'm trying to find out where they were. You say you'll take a picture, catalog properly, guys, please. Um, I couldn't find it. That's looking out towards Berry Head there, that's painting, uh, and that's bricks out in the corner. You can't see it, but you see the, all the land is left to grow over. The squatters got in. If you look up, look it up, uh, the house, I can't tell you the destruction that they visited on it. If you live in Germany, and they make you fix the property up, if it's in dilapidation, they just won't have it. Well, they got in, and I was, I had a quick look around, took pictures of the outside. Lintels had cracked, the soffits had gone. It's, it was distressing, actually. It, and to make matters worse, you think this isn't a listed building, it's a listed building. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Now, if you can feel the absolute, I mean, this is a house that was made to be loved. It really is. And they got in. If you look at pictures of it, what they've done to the inside of it, it just doesn't bear thinking about that, actually. It breaks my heart. But all of this area here, they built these lovely places. And the blue plaque that was assigned to it, they even tried to chip it off and keep it. It's actually a, it's a designated building. But if you don't look after it, and there's no civic duty, believe me, 
the people who don't necessarily have the love for it will uh, destroy it. But do you want to hear the good news story? You do want to hear the good news story, of course you do. So, uh, it's been saved, and this year it gets converted, retains the building as it is, features retains as it is, they've got a load of people in there, and they're going to convert it into very exclusive like apartments and flats, and then they're going to build on the rest of the land that's around it. So it got, it's saved, but only just. Because if you look up the Palace Hotel, which is built by Bishop Philpotts in 1832, no one saved it, demolished. Everything, gone. I couldn't put it on there today, but there's a crate. I took a picture of it, I was walking there, and I was like, I, I said to one of my members of my family, I said, what happened to the hotel? Knocked down, gone. Nobody wanted to save it. So there you go, so use it or lose it. Railways and trams, hurrah, the best part. Um, so you're probably wondering, that's back on Dartmoor again, that's actually a granite railway uh, using a technique where they would take this granite that you've just seen and uh, and uh, ship it. And they had a massive system. It was all drawn by horse, by the way. Uh, and they would bring it down to a place called Team Race, and they would ship it out. Some of it was used in Plymouth to make batteries. And also it was sent, obviously, to London. But there's a couple of railways that you should go and visit. <laughs> I'm so glad that you have. <laughs> I want to go on it. Please do, yeah. because it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you know something? It's they've got so many tenders, so many locomotives. They have um, it, it travels through what I would call probably some of the most pastoral, romantic English countryside that you can get. They do dog tickets. They do yes. do dog tickets. <laughs> By the way, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now giving up this talk and I'm passing over to you. <laughs> Where you all tell me the, the fun times you've had. No. It's, it's, it's beautiful, uh, and it's, uh, it was a, believe it or not, how about this? Uh, if memory serves, it was a listed firm on the exchange. It was that popular, I mean, can you believe it? And by the way, remarkable because uh, the Payton Dunk Side Run Steam Railway is one of the very few railways which isn't run by volunteers. It actually pays for its own stuff. Now it travels across the Hollands Viaduct there, and as you can see, that's the background of Torbay but definitely do go and see it, because it passes through Greenway, oh sorry, passes through Greenway Holt. And Greenway Holt, if you get off, you can then get the train, walk and take a picnic. Just take a picnic and sit in the fields and just look at the rolling hills and just go and visit Greenway House, which is Agatha Christie's place. Yes, it will take you there. That train, where Agatha Christie, in actual fact, uh, based, some of her novels, so when she, when she sat on that train and she would visit it, some of the novels that you read actually use that railway line. And I'm going to come to a little story in a minute. So, uh, in fact, actual facts... Well, we've murdered all the paint and bricks of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and find it now, but I will, I will, I will, I will get to it in a second because I, it'll be on another set separate one. But do, do, do go and visit. It's all open all the way to summer. Don't, don't, don't do it in the uh, it's time. South Devon Railway, who's watched and then there were none? The Agatha Christie yeah. drama, right? Yeah. Do you remember the train speeding up <clears throat> across the, on the, uh, oh, you might have seen it so many times, I think you're probably embedded in my memory now, but, but anyway, it was used for that. It was used for that TV programme, but this is a volunteer line. Another one, they have a, a beer festival there at Staverton, so you can get off and drink beer and things like that. And it terminates at Buckfast Lee. Buckfast Lee has a beautiful uh, abbey, uh, as a, mm. wait, 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 has a beautiful abbey at the top, um, Henry VIII did a great demolition job on some of the idols, but it doesn't matter, you can still see it, and it's marvellously beautiful, so what you do folks is this, you go and take the train up to Buckfast Lee, but you walk all the way back down to the, to Top Ness again, where it picks it up on the main line, it's a great day out, spend a couple of days doing it if you want, here we go, who knows who he is, <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Gary. Yeah, is this Dr. Richard Beeching, who is cha chairman of, of uh, chairman of British, the chairman of the British Railways Board? I should imagine. Uh, for those of you who don't know, and I think very many of you do, he was the one that his main aim was uh, reshaping Britain's railways was a big divide in our time. Get steam traction off. 
the main line, convert it to diesel, and by the way, rip up something like 3,000 miles of track, which we could really do with today. Oops, whose idea was that then? Um, yes, it's, it's him. He's responsible for probably one of the biggest cultural destructions of our railway system. Uh, he was tasked by the government to do one very simple thing, make British Rail profitable. Well, that's like, uh, that's like blood for a stone business. So it's very hard, it, and it never made it. However, it removed some of our lovely lines. Uh, the Payton and Dartmouth Steam Rail was not a beach enclosure, by the way. It was just didn't make any money anyway. But this picture is really amazing, because guess what he's doing? He's reopening one of the railway lines I've just mentioned. <laughs> one swallow does not a spring mate. Indeed that's, indeed, that's true. But I thought I'd give him a bit of a break. And I put him in here. Well, indeed, why? But it's a very unusual picture because if you go to the uh, South End Railway, you'll see a picture of it. Uh, I think the Getty Images one. I wasn't going to pay two hundred and forty-five pounds to get the original. Are they? Um, uh, but uh, he he features in there saying this is where um, he reopened the railway line. <laughs> Quite amazing, really, isn't it? Brunel. No, be quiet. <laughs> The Atmospheric Railway. Who's heard of the Atmospheric Railway? Apart from you guys in the corner. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. The Atmospheric Railway, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that does one to Croydon. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And by the way, did he not borrow from that idea a lot? You're absolutely right. Right, I.K. Brunel. Famous, in, famous, famous engineer. Uh, engineer of the Great Western Railway Company. Um, Built the, built the SS Great Britain, but we'll stop there. But anyway, what did he do? Anyway, in South Devon, he decided, you know what? Pff, let's not do the steam traction anymore. Let's not burn coal. I know. Let's do an atmospheric railway. So, how does an atmospheric railway work? By vacuum. Look at underneath here, and you will see the clue. And I want you to notice that building there, because it's quite important. So, forget steam traction. What do you do? Let's draw a train by having buildings that would go up the uh, uh, go up the uh, uh, up the track, and they would effectively activate a pump that would draw air and pull the train along. Brilliant! I mean, think about how how absolutely revolutionary that was. This is 1848. It sucks. It sucks. <laughs> it's, no, but 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 I but no, but I want you to think about just how forward thinking that is in today's climate. I mean, I, obviously, don't get me wrong. I love my steam train. I beg your pardon. Yes, if you like, if you like. I, I I wanted to put it in here. It was a failed caper in the end. I'll tell you why it failed. Um, it, it failed because uh, it, there's the remains of it. Um, it failed because this happened. <laughs> They decided to uh, cover the seal up using leather coated with tallow. Tallow is beef fat. And the rats would come out in the evenings and go, oh, yeah. lovely, nom, 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 eat it up. And, and they had a terrible trouble trying to run it. Meantime, they were running, at, by the way, that's broad gauge, incidentally, if you're wondering why it's so far apart, that's on purpose. Uh, Brunel was a big fan of broad gauge, uh, not the narrow gauge that we have today. Um, and he, he said, he said, no, 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 this is, this is. anyway, he, even Watt said at the time, uh, yeah, Watt said something along the lines of, this is folly, this won't work, well, he proved himself right. Anyway, meantime, all the trains were actually, the steam power traction was actually running on the line and making money. Embarrassing or what? But anyway, I wanted to put it in there because not many people know. I think it's a nice thing to put in because not many people know about the, what they call the, uh, the caper, the atmospheric caper. And he didn't do that. By the way, I.K. Brunel built himself a, a manor called Br Brunel Manor, which is in Devon. He loved it so much he wanted to stay there. Uh, and you can, it's private residence now, but you can go and see it. Talky tramways, another failed but beautiful example of, of, of something I think is far-sighted, but didn't, uh, didn't quite make it. However, it's kind of still around. As, uh, as Torbay grew and, and uh, a few other uh, coastal towns grew in popularity, they decided to 
build a tram system, but they didn't want to have the cable system that went over the top of it. That was considered vulgar. What to do? What you do, by the way, this picture doesn't reflect it, you'll see why in a minute. Uh, what you do is you put your electricity transmission under the ground. Sensible, right? It kind of makes sense. Look today, you'll see on the third rail, you know, any trains going in towards Kent, they will use that, that particular rail. Well, the overhead, the, 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 the local population found the overhead cables vulgar, so they invited the company to come and do it, known as the Delta Stud Contact Company. Right? And it works like this. So the tram comes along, and there's a kind of uh, skate or ski collector underneath, so it picks it up, and the current is situated at certain bars as it comes along, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's activated. So there's a, at nine foot intervals, a box was fitted between the rails that contained a stud and a bell crank, and the magnet passing on the train raises that stud, connects it, has enough power to take it to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and you see where this is going. Problem. Brilliant idea, I think, uh, and sad it never made it. Because what would happen is that sometimes the driver was aware that sometimes the crank and the, the stud would not fall, so it, it, would still be, it would still be there, above ground, electrified. And in fact, this actually happened, and the reason I've chosen the chap with the horse, look, at that, isn't that incredible? Horse-drawn, this is, this is only 100 years ago. Horse-drawn carriages and an electric tram next to it, I find rather remarkable. Um, what to do. Uh, so what they decided was to, uh, when, when a horse came across it, it stood on it and killed, and, and it got electric. <laughs> and then the Board of Trade turned up and said, well, we're we going to have to, because they do, they still test railway lanes today, border inspection is still done by the Department of Transport. And they came along and they said, right, well, we're going to test your system, sir. Of course you can, sir. Ah, that's protruding, that's protruding. Anyway, the icing on the cake for, the, for, the, for this whole beautiful system was unbelievably South Devon does not get snow. But on the very year that they were trying to get this thing to work, guess what happens? Oh. It snows. Horses everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, so and, and, and the other thing that happens was, and this, this is just really unlucky of fortune, so be careful sometimes, I think you have to really think about this. They didn't use galvanized steel, they used iron parts. Oh man alive, I mean, you know, really? Um, it, it, had they done that, then I think things would have been different. And again, back to what we now have, trains again. Wouldn't it be great? That's gridlock, that road, sometimes. It's horrible. Horrible. Do we want the Pope? <laughs> Do we want Rome? I don't know. But anyway, guess who turns up? <laughs> he does indeed. Uh, I... Well, judge that most people would understand what this is, but anyway, he came back to reclaim from the Netherlands and he decides, you know what, yeah, I'm coming back. And uh, by the way, haven't they made look bricks and look amazing? Is it really that many miles? Is that many ships? I don't know. Stay off the tram line. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes along and he says, no, 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 we're going, this is the point where we're not going to have any of this Roman Catholicism. I don't have a view about this guy, but I actually hasten to add. So he comes along, and he, where does he make his appearance? Well, he turns up in Brixham. There is the statue to him, William, Prince of Orange. People even go swimming in Brixham, I understand. Well, anyway, if you'd have gone there and walked around, if you'd have walked around the harbour side, here he landed on the spot, and he said, I will maintain, I will maintain the Protestant faith. And so that's where he landed. And there's another part in Dutch. It says, uh, let me see if I can get my Dutch working. Uh, for the Inge Ingerlands of Leihide, which means for England's freedom. And it's right there. And it's quite interesting because uh, the liberties of England and the Protestant religion I shall maintain. And there is, there is, there is an old... Folk bit of folklore actually, which says that he had apples rolled down at him when he turned up. But this isn't true. Uh, it's unlikely he did. In fact, actually, the the you can't even call it an invading force because it really it kind of, it wasn't. No, he was just welcoming on board. But um, the road which leads from there that goes up to the Napoleonic Fort is play, is called Overgang. And Overgang means um, passage or crossing. So we still have a name called Overgang. Uh, 
which is still there. I just want to bring this one in because it's quite useful actually right now. Uh, anyone been watching the news with Abide With Me? Abide With Me, beating the retreat in India, Abide With Me. Uh, you may have heard they're wanting to get rid of it. Decolonising, yeah. Yeah, you may, you may be aware. Okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, there he is. Uh, uh, there he is there. Standing there. This is Brixham Harbour. That's Golden Hind. Well, an interesting little thing I bring into Brixham is that uh, the Reverend Francis Light, who wrote Abide With Me, wrote it when he was staying in, Be in Brixham, in the very head hotel, and he was very sick when he wrote it. And as he looked across Torbay, he was dying, man. He was felt inspired to write this piece, Abide With Me. So, it's actually grieving on Ah, interesting. Well, all it says on the, the part that I know on the outside that he was simply yeah, grieving for, for what it gave. And the words came into his mind. So there we are. So it's great. So, but anyway, that's, that's, that, that's uh, uh, part of it. So uh, that rough and rowdy, what it used to be uh, some nights, but sorry, Brixonians, if you, if you hear it. Mm. Some people pay taxes, and some people don't. <laughs> and I think, I think this needs a bit of discussion. Stop sniggering at the back, I can hear you. In Plymouth, very important naval place, that is the place where the Mayflower sat sail from. His final place that it went from. It went all the way around, actually, the south coast. It didn't just set sail from Mayflower. And an interesting fact to note, that most of the people who went weren't from Devon. They were from Nottinghamshire and places like that. It started off from the Mayfair um, pub in Correct, it did, yes. And, 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 yes, it did, yeah. We hated them. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure because you were so clever and you just kept telling them things. Uh, but, 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 but I always get, I'm hated to remind people, no, it's set up in the Thames and people were like, no, 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 it didn't. I said, yeah, I've been to the pub where it did. Of course it did. But anyway, but this is the Mayflower Steps and go into it. But if you go into the Admiral Bride pub in the back, you will see a list of the people, the infantry that, 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 that left there. And they departed in September 1620. Unfortunately, one of the great tragedies as well, that uh, unfortunately most of the historic parts of Plymouth got destroyed. Uh, parts of the Barbican, the historic Barbican, phew, survived, but not very much. But if you do get a chance to go there, that's really all there is. But, but do, do, do pop into the... To the, to the pub. <laughs> This is the one's for you. Scrumpy. Scrump, scrump means to steal, by the way. What is? Food and drink. Time to break a few sacred cows, I think. Greetings from Devon and the West Country. When you hear people say I'm from the West Country, I'm from Devon, they mean it interchangeably. West Country is anywhere from Somerset, Devon, uh, Cornwall, and Dorset. Plymouth Gin. Old and venerable place and thing that has is produced on that, on, in Plymouth still. Owned by Perno now, Recar, I think. But it's been, it's on the site of a former monastery, and their botanicals are awesome. If you want to drink the real thing, what sailors probably would have drunk themselves, that's it. Buy it, because yeah, it's the real the Only the yeah, sure, of course. But uh, I'm just saying if you wanted to get to, to get down there, it's still on the but still on the barbecue. It hasn't moved. Incredible, really. And it hasn't hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, uh, shifted off. I wanted to put this in, and this one's going to be especially useful for you. I put beer in, and I'm saying, well, okay, so why have you put beer? Well, beer's manufactured, sorry, uh, brewed everywhere. Well, this is important because this is a building which closed a few years ago, and it's important because this is Tucker's Maltings, and what they're doing is something known as a floor maltings process. It is not done anymore. There was a place in Leeds, you might be able to help me at the back, uh, but uh, there's only two floor maltsters left in the whole of the United Kingdom that I am aware of. Tucker's Maltings was one of the last, and it closed a couple of years ago. What happens? Well, you might know that's the part of the germination process that's going on there. Yep. And they're huge floors, and you tip the malt out, and somebody is back-breaking work. I promise you I've seen it. You come along with a special shovel, and you turn over to stop it germinating. Yeah? And then it's 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 it's... it's it's, it's uh, heated to the appropriate process. I, I actually was very lucky enough a few years ago. Uh, no, hang on. Yeah, story, story straight here. 2009, 2010. And so they kept niggling me. I said, oh, so, 
really how long can this last? You know, how long can this four maltings process last? Probably not for very much longer. So I went on the tour of Tucker's maltings. I was the only one on it. I promise you, I was the only one. It was heartbreaking. The, the lady took me round, said this is this. It was all so formulaically done. It was almost like, okay, and this is, and this. And, and, I, and, I, and I kind of, you know, obviously, we're all huge fans of the of very good quality beer. And I thought, you know what, I don't think this is going to make it. But if you're interested to know, I bought three cases of Tucker's Maltings, because they used to produce their own stuff, of Empress Russian Porter, which is about 10% Ooh, alcohol. Wow. It is barnstorming, I promise you. I keep it, my mum uses some of it for her Christmas puddings because it's so rich and good, but it's gone. It has gone, and that's the part. There it is, that's the building. All yeah. of this back area here is used to turn the malt, and uh, it's finished. 122 years of history gone, and now that will probably be turned into flat. Cider. And was sailing, which is an interesting tradition. I did a piece on this, but I thought it best not to get into too much of the detail in cider. But what I can tell you is this. Do you want to make your own cider? Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> I used to. Yeah, I make make your own. Sort of, yeah, you can make your own cider, yeah. and and you can copy it from the Belgians' idea of of, of lambic, which is spontaneous fermentation. Mm -hmm. And what you do is, and go to a in in about October November time, do go to a cider festival in Somerset or Devon or Dorset. I beg of you if you get the chance to go to one. I go to the one known as the one in Cockington, and it's great fun. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any. Pictures of me like just looking like all oh, googly eyed like this. <laughs> and it. But what you can do is they will press, they have a press that's about 200, 200 years old, 150 years old, and they pour or collect all the apples up from around uh, uh, parts of Devon, put it into the press, and you go there with your, with your, your jug, you can collect it. So we fill the, I used to fill up with Demijohns, you put a top in it. With a little uh, what's what's that called? Airlock, 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 airlock thank you, airlock, 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 and you leave it, and 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 in, and in six to eight months' time or nine months' time, however it is, you've got your cider because it converts to sugar and it uses yep. spontaneous fermentation. It's beautiful. It's some of the richest cider. It's beautiful. It tastes great. It's like drinking Brasson cider, to which we owe a little bit of a debt because cider, cidre, looks like it may have come with a Norman invasion. Mm -hmm. It's highly, highly likely. Highly yeah. likely. Yeah. But it's great, but I used to make my own. And once you've opened it, you've got to drink it pretty quick. But if you don't drink it pretty quick, you can take a piece of pork, pour in, pour in, you know, scrape in some, some uh, lemon, leeks, onions, shallots, pour it all in and just cook it for hours. Absolutely superb. Let's bust some myths. Pasties. No, it's not. No. Pasties. Cornish pasty, yes. The European Union said that, and the presidency designation, I don't know if that even applies anymore, I don't know what happened to that. Yeah. Uh, Cornish pasties, yes, they've called it a Cornish pasty, but a pasty, to do with this crimping, is eaten throughout Devon and Cornwall. And it's the earliest known recipe, it's 1501, and it's Plymouth. Now, I grant you, Plymouth sits on the other side of the River Tamar from Cornwall. You can literally, you know, throw a rock on the other side and you're in there. But I, I want to get rid of this idea. It's just, it's just Cornwall has. Or, or, and I'm going to say in a minute why Devon has this. Because we don't. Because I think we have a shared history. And I'd like us to think that way. And I'd, by the end of the evening, I'd like you to feel the same way about uh, pasties. What's in it? So... To make it, it has to come from beef skirt, turnip, if we get that right, and then it's baked and cooked in the right way. If you add anything like cheese into it or bacon, it's not pasty. It's something completely different. Carrots? No. No, not pasty. No, no, not pasty. You can't adulterate the three main, the three main things. It's, it really is labourer's food, uh, but it tastes great. And 
the crimping's important. So the Cornish will always tell you the crimping is important. But when you go and you get apple apple pasties and, and, and yeah, okay, that's very creative, I understand that, but that's not the real deal. So if you want to go and have a pasty or an oggy, as it's also known as, uh, you can. Lardy cake. Anyone ever had any lardy yeah. cake? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, something that's fast just being out of our culture, really. Very popular to see in bakeries uh, in Devon when I was younger. Um, not so much now. It is flour baked heavy with uh, sultanas. And then what you do is you dip it in fat. And it, it's dripping with fat, basically. Um, but it tastes really, really good. I've seen like, and there's some spices in there as well. Uh, the lardy cake is, is indeed delicious. Uh, where's the gentleman? Straight down the end tomorrow. Thank you for the lardy cake. But it's a lardy cake. But anyway, enjoy it. Because, uh, but, but like a lot of things uh, around here, and we're going to come to this in a minute, uh, hog's pudding, is, that's got that's kind of a bit of a recurrence. It's pig, but it has oats in it. So, if you, so sometimes there's a farm up in um, Ockham, which serves this, and I go just for the hogs pudding because it's superb. I know how to cook it. Almost similar to like German vice versa, you know, where they cook it really, 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 really well. Yes, we've got our stuff as well, you know. It's not just localized from Bavaria, although what I have in Bavaria is absolutely superb. Let's get this sorted out. Because, first of all, this is a, 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 a product that, first of all, would not have been scones. It would not have been scones because it's too difficult to, not difficult to make, but it didn't evolve that way. It's likely that the scone part came from Scotland through immigration coming down. It is likely to have been something known as a pocket. A pocket is a, is a, 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 is a slightly different and it's probably likely to have come from Chudley, or Chudley, which is in Devon. It's a very, very small place in mid-Devon. Uh, now, to produce cream, uh, well, let's just start with the, what I've said first to debunk the scone business. Like I said, it's would it come from mid-Devon, but we share a lot of things between Cornwall, Devon, Dorset, etc. But a split would have gone something like this. Have you ever had a... Oh, it's hard to explain, but you know what, you know... Dollar kebab. <laughs> <laughs> you get flour, you bake it, 450 grams. Well, I've got the ingredients here. Salt, yeast, caster sugar, butter and whole milk. And you're making like a sweet bread, a sweet yeah, bready dough. And Sally yes. Yeah, and yeah. That's Pro yeah, that's a, yeah, I would go with that. I, I like yeah. that one. I like that a lot. So it's likely they were served hot and then you pour the cream and, uh, and then you eat it and it was served promptly. This, I'm not saying this is, this is beautiful, but this is one of my, I mean, I love having this. I don't say it's wrong and you can have cherries and sultanas and currants, but it's, it, I'd say that came more along in the late 1900s, but in agricultural times, I'd say it was more likely to be a pocket or a Devon split filled with jam and cream. But how to make the cream? Well, the cream's very interesting actually. Uh, uh, you take full, full milk and it's a process of scalding. So you scald it and then it, you leave it and then it settles and separates and, you, and it goes through that process again. It's very labour intensive and, and very expensive to do, I suppose. Um, and the jam is entirely up to you, but you'll probably be eating it with plums. Isn't that, isn't that a Cornish scone? Because that's jam first, isn't it? I think it was cream. Right, okay, so this, this, this is another one which I, 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 think, is, I think it's recent rivalry, but, but there's a, there's, so for those who don't know, there's an etiquette around this. Um, there's an etiquette around this which says, excuse me, which says uh, it's cream on first, then jam, and then you eat it. Well, I've seen people turning this into a sandwich. I've also seen people putting it in the wrong way around as crown going everywhere. Please eat it with a fork, for the love of God. You know, I mean, it's you know, be civilized. Uh, but it's, it, 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 I don't think it really makes any difference. I'm a jam on first guy and then the cream on, and then I like mine with cherries in my scones, uh, which I have. But I've also prepared it pocket style as well, the split. I've also done split. And by the way, it's devilishly good making it as a split. So there's something about the bread dough of it which tastes really good. But it looks like um, it came from a Benedictine monastery that got dissolved. 
And the workers who were working there, uh, this would have been the 10th century, looks like they were rewarded by payment by using something that looks like of not the clotted cream you'd see today. There's no way they could have made that then. It's probably, it's probably the cream from the surface of, of milk, you know, more than likely, uh, not, not what you see today. And they were rewarded like that, and it was something they could take away from how. Words and phrases. Albisti, it begur at tomorrow's club. And this here Jan will show you directly. Anyone know what I said when I wrote that? No. <laughs> How are you? It is going to be lush tomorrow's club. And this here Devon person will show you now. Yeah, it's all. And if you'd notice the bist part, that comes from German. Yeah, because of course, Anglo Saxon. Words and phrases. I put the Roman coin in there. That's not a joke. Guess where that was found? In a small, obscure hamlet, almost a hamlet, so a town, village hamlet called Ippelpen. And it's thought that the Romans, they did obviously go all the way to Cornwall to extract mines, but they found these silver coins in Ippelpen. You've got to imagine this. This is a very pastoral little tiny, tiny village, and they dug it up. Someone from metal detecting it, they found it. So I've kept that there. Just to tell you, is that Romulus and Remus, by the way? The, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The wolf, the she wolf. The wolf, the she wolf. The, wolf, the, the she wolf was the sea wolf. Yes. The, yes. The, what is famous today, they yes. have the two children drinking, they were added in the ah, 1500s. I see. Uh, I, I won't ask you to take the coin, but anyway, but that was found there. Words and phrases Jasper, it means a. Um, what? Thank you. Albisti, how are you? Dimpsy. Not dusk, not light, a bit between. Gur, lush, directly, directly. Where's it to? If you ever meet anyone from Devon, I say this when I go back, I always say, oh, where's it to? I, I, I don't, I lapse, I move out of speaking in this quasi-received pronunciation that I have, it's not quite received pronunciation at all, but, but uh, I, I change it to, um, uh, to something which is more in common with what you would find down there. Ought means anything. Blid is a poor person. And uh, Janna, and I'm going to correct this here as well, actually, Janna is not a pejorative word. Chav, you know, you hear this word chav, uh, is obviously used in a pejorative term. Janna, about 15 years ago, was started to be used pejoratively. It's not pejorative. Janna simply means a person from Devon. I'm one. Okay, but I'm not, was it what I described? So I, I, I think it's what, I think that's worth putting out there. So I was so, but where it comes from, I don't quite know. <clears throat> and it's words from Celtic origin, which is jonic, meaning pleasant or agreeable. And here it is. So, low German. Ich bin, I be, a be, I am. Du bist, die bist, you are. Easy, huh? So that's where it's moved across in time. But I haven't heard it spoken very often, these when people say, how bist thee, or how bist uh, it's, it's disappearing. Why? Well, it's probably cultural changes in our society. I don't know. But my next door neighbour, when I used to live with him, he was 90 something when he died. We would always speak using. We would. Do, I, I used to dress him for fun. I'd say, I've been up and for And yeah, he'd be middling. How are you? I'm fine. Yeah, but again, people don't want to use it. Uncool, whatever it might be. I don't know. Ah, uh -huh. culture. More is dancing. Lace making. When you think of lace making, you probably think of Nottingham. But you should think of Honiton. Yeah, you should think of Honiton because Honiton made some absolutely superb lace. Uh, and it's likely uh, that uh, it came from, uh, it's likely it came from uh, the Huguenots, Flemish. Indeed it was. Yes, it was. Yes, it's made with uh, Honiton lace. There's a museum there. Go see it. And there's a real skill to making lace. If you want to learn something that's the ultimate patience, it works on bobbins, and this is how it goes. So you have about eight or nine of them, and you have a, a pins in it, and then the lace, and then what you do is you're, you're, you're maneuvering each piece like that, and then it goes back in. It's beautiful, and I have- Is it in common with the Brittany? No, oh, is it really? The Brittany is it? Well, that's interesting, that's very interesting. Yes, yeah, Brittany is Brittany. Yeah, 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 well, thank you for that. Uh, but it's, uh, most people would normally think of Nottinghamshire, and that's fine, that's, that's a, they're worthy for that. Nottingham is machine, though. 
Ah, I see. Right, well, I only know it. I thought that they both did both, so forgive me. And parts and places in Ireland as well, I thought that it was also hand on. But this is uh, uh, hand, and obviously the lacing would go around the, each of the cuffs. Uh, it's beautiful to do, but if you want to do it, it's possible to do it. I met someone at the Devon County Show, and, she, and I said, how peaceful, I just asked her the question, I said, how peaceful do you feel when you're finishing this? And she said, yeah, just time just flies by. You know, it's wonderful, wonderful. Europe's oldest purpose-built cinema. The Paint and Picture House. Opened on the 16th of March, 1914. Now, there's lots of, it's the oldest, and there's the oldest, and I live in Crouch End, and there's another oldest. But I think this has got some merit to it, because it was actually built then. They were showing silent films then. But if you sit in, and it's another, this is another, you see there's, uh, sorry, but you see there's uh, hoardings going up around here. This is another building that in 1999, they just shut the building down and left it, which is very sad, but they're refurbishing it. So if you're lucky enough to sit in seat two, row two of the circle, that would be Agatha Christie's seat, who also used to go and visit it. And the name Churston, which goes back to what you were saying earlier on, a stop on the paint in the Dartmouth Steam Railway is used for the letter C in her book, The Alphabet Murders. So you get a little bit of history too. But it was fantastic, you used to go there. It's very tiny, the seats all sort of stiff like that. And uh, it was dreadful actually, because you'd watch the film and it would go, and it would place would go to pitch black because the systems they were using were so old that it comes to the end of its life in that era. But it's due for a refurbishment again, we'll come back. Traditions and ceremonies. Are you man enough to do the tar barrel? Now, that chap there, this is Ottery St. Mary, and there's been a tradition since the 1600s where what you would do is you would fill, the, fill part of the a barrel up and roll it down the street. Why they do this? So some wise folk decides, no, 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 no. You're gonna carry it on your back. <laughs> so they run around the streets of Ottery St. Mary with a flaming tar barrel on their back. And it's great. Go and look at any, any YouTube thing. It's worth seeing. It's one of these really quirky, little traditions that you see around Devon, and it's wonderful. Um, I think he's just the person to that notice that he's, he, the, he's reasonably safe. But it's still dangerous because I've seen pictures of this where the barrel is actually breaking to bits, but it, it's great. It's one of these quirky things that, that we used to do. The lustly May Day. Yes. Fantastic. If you go to, to, into Dartmoor, go and see what Cromwell, thankfully, didn't manage to annihilate because I think it was him that was responsible for the axing of most of our maypoles in this country thereby. If you go to Sweden, you'll still see their midsummer. Uh, but here, no, <laughs> bang, gone. Um, but this survived somehow, I don't know. It goes on, they have a May Queen and they crown her with flowers. And it's lovely and there's, there's festivals and there's drinking and it's great fun. It really is lovely. And it's nicely done. Go and see it because you can't see this, but here, Etched onto this piece of granite are all of the names of all the May Queens that have a crown since 18... Blah, 50? But it's wonderful to go and see, see this, this absolutely fantastic festival, which is, which is, I think, one of the core parts of our paganistic Celtic culture. And there we have it. There is a proper maypole. And I love going to see it because a lot of them have, have not survived. You, know, you see them in village greens. But of course, you know, a lot of people, some of them probably don't even know the dances. You know, it's like sea shanties. Where do you find it now? It's very hard to find. But isn't that lovely? All the, all of the, oops, all of the, uh, and, and that's Devon, by the way. That, that, that's, that, that's an apple tree. <laughs> just so you know. Uh, but it's wonderful how the, how the hills just roll around and there's this lovely village being beautiful. And here's some history to yeah. But historic, so it's, it's been around for a long, long time. Devon County Show, do go, because it's great fun. It's an agricultural show. There's a lot, if you're very much into steam traction, as I am, and I'm sure you are, uh, do pop along to it. Um, it's changed its form uh, a little bit over the years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, to reveal a slightly much more interesting in uh, producing a different kind of clientele. Um, but they've... they've, they've <laughs> And I'm not so much interested in that, but you, obviously it's just a combination of the time, but they have a monster truck. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know. Moving on. Here he is. Here's our King of Devon, Geraint. Yes. Santa, is it sounds Welsh? It's because it probably he is Welsh. Um, but we on to notable people who lived and visited. And the final section of the show tonight. Uh, and there he is, probably very romanticised picture of him. Uh, that's done 1840. Um, but I want to introduce you to a big, big heavy hitter. Who's heard of him? Hands up. Newcomer. Yeah, you should be to the museum, I'm sure. <laughs> who's heard of, who's heard of, just honestly, who's heard of Newcomer here? Yeah. Who's heard of Watt and Bolton? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who came first? Oh, would you? Which <laughs> show? Be quiet in the cheap seats. Yeah, yeah. It's the peanut gallery. <laughs> Uh, Thomas Newcomen, right, okay, what, what James Watt and, and, and Matthew Bolton perfected the steam traction, but they didn't invent it. He did. And his name was Thomas Newcomen, and he lived in Dartmouth. And uh, he was a local man, his family was from there, and he invented this, uh, he invented something called the miner's friend, okay? What's the miner's friend? It's this. He, about 17, oh, I've got my number here, 1712, so he started, 1712, uh, it, 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 it's, it's incredible to think how far we've come, but what would happen is, sorry, fuel burnt, I think, I think we go to the next one, there we go, it works, wow, it works, here we go, this is Thomas Newcomen's steam engine, I hope the gift would work, and it has, so, it, it, it's a very, very unsophisticated way of, of, of producing steam and drawing the uh, water up from the mine because they were regularly flooding. So don't forget that uh, 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 Devon and Cornwall, that's our tradition, it's mining. And he kind of thought, well, let's think about this. Now, he went into collaboration. I should say this, actually. There was a French person that had, had an idea about this and, and, and I believe the two perfected it. But if you go to um, if you go to Dartmouth where he lived, he was a, by the way he was a preacher. Interesting, most people uh, it just doesn't come up very often. But when he wasn't doing that, I, mean, I don't think he was quite a polymath as such. But I think it's quite interesting that, that, that he spent the time to do both. There's the real thing. That's the original. It's in Dartmouth. You can go and see it. It's supported now by you know, the mechanism. They can't obviously get to work because we be burning lots of coal and doing it. But nonetheless, you can go and visit in Dartmouth. And that's the beginning of what I consider to be what started it all. This wonderful thing, this wonderful invention that he produced. There's a little tiny museum. It's in Dartmouth. You can go visit it. Uh, there's not much there apart from that. But it's, again, it's still worth touching history. And I think that you should. That's... This is Dartmouth Harbour here. The Royal Naval College is just up to the left. And just in there would be Greenway House, where Agatha Christie lived. Mm -hmm. okay, so you can kill off lots of things. So Collis and Fishacre is over there. Greenway is here. And Newcomen's pump is there. You can see lots of things. There's yeah. a little ferry that you can take. There the is. There, there is indeed. Yes, there is. You probably went to the castle too. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Way of stopping these two pieces. <laughs> anyway, but let's move on. But I'm, I'm glad you visited. And by the way, one of the things I started to see on um, uh, was was during the lockdown when they couldn't go abroad. Is people actually going back to Devon and Cornwall again for holidays? I was really excited by that because I thought, yes, go and see this wonderful topography, this geology, this great traditions that we've had, and I hope that you, you would do. Well, you know, I don't think I need any introduction, does it really? It's Agatha Christie. She lived, she was born in Torquay. Her house has been knocked down now. Um, unfortunately, she was, the church where she was baptised is still there. But that's her house, Greenway. And I think this kind of typifies, really, that the sort of, what, this is what I love so much about, this is blazing, obviously, in the middle of summer. That's her home, and it's just rolling countryside. And that's Dissisham and Gampton Creek going up towards there. The guy that, um, I hope I can say this, but there's a very, very famous car producer's home is up there. That's all I'll say, just to obviously give them the privacy that they deserve. But Gampton Creek is lovely. I mean, it's a part of the world where you can really be inspired by the local uh, countryside. And inside there, that's a home. That's, a, I believe, Queen Anne dining tables. Behind there is a beautiful Chinese vase. It's incredible. And if you get a chance to stay here, and you should, because you can, you can get married here as well, um, you can 
in actual fact, uh, um, uh, staying with it. I urge you to use the bathtubs. We're not just talking bathtubs here. We are talking beautiful, deep. You, know, you can actually just float in them. They're great. And um, it's, it's absolutely worth paying it a visit and seeing at night, the place creaks and the floorboards move and the heating goes. But it's, it produces such a lovely atmosphere. And also, if you're looking for something else as well, I think this is worth saying. It's not quiet, it's deathly silent. Silence. You know, I had an actuarial friend of mine for a couple of years say that the, the biggest problem humans have got is noise at the moment. You know, noise affects stress. It's, it has interesting parts in our psyche. But when you go to places like this and stay around here, the silence is incredible. So, for that reason alone, I can understand why it's a good place to write. Uh, and it really is. Evil in war. Yes. Ah, but he didn't live there. He didn't. But guess what I found? And I think I saved the best for last year. I did. So I was staying with my sister in Dartmoor and I said, well, you know, where do I want to go to next? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go up to Chagford. Well, Chagford's lovely. And I thought, let's have a quick look at Chagford. I haven't been Chagford in ages. And it just so happens I took Bryce Head Revisited down for my holidays. And I thought, well, I'll just read it in the evenings. And I went through and I think Evening War wrote Bryce Head Revisited in Chagford. <laughs> so I said to my brother-in-law, would you mind taking me up to this to Chagford? I just want to look around. Yeah, of course, no problem. So he did. And there was a man cutting the grass outside. And he's cutting the grass and I said, excuse me, I know this is going to sound absolutely bonkers bearing my book in hand. I said, I happen to know that uh, uh, Evelyn Moore stayed here. Is this true? He went, yeah, yeah, she said, do you want me to go and get the owner for you? And I said, would you mind? And he said, no, no, no. He goes, well, you, you know, you kind of you look like that. So, you know, you probably really should. I'm sorry about that, Chairman. No ties, you'll observe. I'm sorry about that in right. advance. Shocking. Um, so anyway, so I got it and he took me into the property, which is now no longer a hotel. It's a private residence. And he took me to the place. He said, I think from what we've been told it has been written here. What a lovely thing. Just absolutely great. Serendipitous, unusual, but lots of fun. So I put the book there and had it not for that guy cutting the lawn and me just having a look and a little read around, I would have never have known, I would never have gone. Dumber. That's a rude screen. Not unusual. Medieval. Not demolished. Sort of. <laughs> Henry VIII, as you know, when he broke from Rome, decides... <sighs> if there's ever cultural destruction that you've seen on a likes that certain other organisations throughout the world have done, the cultural destruction I think visited on parts of the monasteries and the churches in Devon, uh, uh, or throughout England actually, are just horrific. I really do think that. However, getting to the, as today as then, getting to these places is rather hard. This church and a few others, that I, this was one of my little cycling tours, which some of you may recall I did a couple of summers ago. And I was going, and unlike London, I say London, some other places, the churches here are unlocked. So you can actually just walk in and see them. And boy, are you in for a treat. Because most of this stuff would have been removed. And what I saw was this. Yes, it's it's Tudor desecration, and you see this over and over and over and over again. And it, it's it's remarkable, really, when you look at it and you think, my God, I'm actually looking at someone actually taken. Can you imagine doing that today? Well, actually, you could because we've just seen a building that people do do that. So, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it surely runs. Um, so, but but you see this, and time after time, idols after idols scratched out, but. But thank God they didn't destroy so much of it that we couldn't enjoy it today. And it's great. So if you get the chance to go to some of the rural churches, do so. Because it's great. You will need a car, as I've said. I've, it's a clapper bridge. Yeah. It is a clapper bridge. That's one of the big ones. Meaty, one of the biggest clapper bridges. It has. Why is it called a clapper bridge? Well, it's made out of stone. And they're all over England. But uh, rather than uh, at a time when you just use the local importing stone and actually giving it some feel and, 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 and 
some purpose and some decoration and ornament. No, 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 no. What they would do is they would just hew out great big pieces of rock and just put them into place. These are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, uh, probably thousands actually, I should think. But can you imagine the energy it takes to do that? I think that's rather remarkable. And they are numerous around, you can still see them in Yorkshire and places like that, but they're more numerous in Devon constraints than some strange region. And I like going across them because you think, well, you know, who's walked across this? Who's walked across this bridge before me? You know, it's a lovely thing. Sometimes it's been the case in the 19th century where uh, the locals have run off with the, with the carpet bridges to make things with, which is a bit rude, if you ask me. Yes, you did visit. And I'm going to leave this one to you. Because he wrote, he came to stay in Devon, and he wrote, I think, the importance of being earnest. But I'm going to leave it to you to try and find out where you think he might have written it. Because he did, and he enjoyed it very much. Back when Devon was very rural, uh, you know, getting there would have been quite a difficult thing to do. I am done. Thank you very much for your time. Cornwall's little sister, as it likes to be known. Um, so thank you very much. Go I'm on. sure he's more than happy to answer any I questions. I can take have. any questions you have. Do them. I know that not people, you. I know that, sorry, not I know you. that people... Devon doesn't own long, just own long houses. They're also found in South East of Ireland. They were well, they're part of the reason picked too yeah. much by the famine. And they built single-story farmhouses and just, you had your cattle sure. on end and you just yeah. kept yeah. standing there. It's only essential to describe. Yeah, and... It's next door to my sister's farm. Yeah, sure, same, same, yeah, exactly, you're absolutely right. Same in Breton as well. I mean, you can see how deep you can go with this with this yeah. thing, but I totally accept yeah. what you say, yeah. No, absolutely right. But you can also teach you maple dance, a sweet Yeah. You yeah. still could do it as well if you want. Yeah. 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 I think... Because I haven't done it for about two years now. Oh, I right. think some people like to get to the bar, the toilet, so yes. other questions can be done just directly yep. to Mark, please. I'd just like to thank him again for a wonderful time. Thank you. Time. Thank you to the committee. Thank you all for turning up. <laughs> Thanks to you at home watching this. I hope the technology works. Uh, see you next month.